What's a cloister? And why did monks like to wander in them? Did monks sleep in a cell? And if so, why? Were abbeys wall to keep people out? Or to keep monks in? Was the night stair to let monks easily file into the church at night? Or to secretly leave for some nefarious purpose? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I'm Professor Jerome Arkenberg, and I have been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about how monasteries were laid out and what they contained, how abbey and other churches were laid out, and where monks slept, ate, studied, contemplated, worked, and otherwise lived. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video. But first, make sure to click like, share, and subscribe, and that little bell thingy, so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. Overall, a monastery was designed to have every facility needed for life. And so it resembled a small town, centered around a church and a cloister, including a refectory, dorter, rear dorter, kitchen, buttery, chapter house, library, school. You see an example of it here at Newry Abbey in Ireland. Infirmary, guest house, Abbot's house, barns, bakeries, laundries, workshops, storerooms, vegetable and herb gardens, orchards, grain fields, and a mill. Though the exact layout varied based on geography from one region to the next. And here we see two different types, St. Bennett's Abbey and Lewis Priory. This one simply instead just follows the course of the river and the stream. Lewis is far more square. Normally, the entire monastery was surrounded by a wall, even in towns, as you see here. Estrada Florida Abbey in Ireland, Lewis Priory again in the town of Lewis right here. And in Ely uh, in England, uh, the uh, abbey closed the wall around it. Laymen only allowed access by the west door of the church or a gatehouse into an outer court. And in that outer court might be found a mill, tannery, smithy, workshops for carpenters and masons, barns, dovecots, fish ponds, gardens, pasture, even a wool house. The inner court often had a guest house housing for the conversi and the oblates, or the tertiaries, plus the brewery, laundry, bakehouse, granary, storerooms, and stables. You see here three rather different types of plans. Uh, Comer Abbey, Bewley Abbey, and, um, gosh, I can't remember what this one is. Uh, here, of course, is Dean Abbey. You can see the interior, sort of a nice cutaway view here. The church was usually the first building constructed as it was central to the monastic life. And like other churches in the Middle Ages, was always aligned east to west. Here, east to west in a cruciform shape. The choir window, the choir being this part here, facing east, so the rising sun would illuminate the church. So you can see, if you don't know, this would be the choir window. The nave goes right down the center of the church. These here are, this is the crossing right in between. The transepts, south and north, are the two arms of the cross. 
The bell towers would be here. The apse is the far end of the church, sometimes semicircular, sometimes flat square. A main stair often going down into the crypt and the choir itself right about here. At the west end, facing the setting sun, an often magnificent rose window would illuminate the church in the afternoon. So again, you have the choir window illuminates the church. When the sun is in the east, and as the sun begins to set, it hits the rose window in the west. And of course, the rest of the day, you usually tend to have these magnificent large windows, especially on the south side of the church, to illuminate the church. Artificial lighting back then, normally you don't want to light torches in the church, risk of fire. And candles, candles would still be needed at many of the services, but candles still cost money or effort. So pretty much every mass would have been taken care of, hopefully, in the daytime to take full advantage of the sun. The west entrance led directly into the nave, where normally the laity would worship standing up. There were no pews as yet. So if you had to kneel, you would kneel directly on the ground. You don't sit, you either stand or you kneel. And then the laity had their own altar and pulpit for the sermon at the rood screen. And here would be a rood screen, usually a stone or wooden partition, which separated the church from the part where the laity can go and the part where the monks or the canons can go along with the priest. So here we are. This is the rood screen at York Minster. All of the, all of the uh, statues, of course, at the time would have been painted to be as lifelike as possible. This is Canterbury Cathedral. And here is this simply St. Edmundsbury Church. In each case, for example, this is where the priest could come up and give a sermon to the laity. But the altar is not visible primarily to the uh, laity. Uh, again, there would be sometimes, sometimes one out in front, but you should be at least be able to see up to the high altar. In the choir, the monks or canons sat facing each other in wooden stalls, where their song would transport the faithful to heaven, at least temporarily. Again, here we are at Litchfield Cathedral, Lincoln Cathedral. And of course, this is the example, a cutaway view. So this would be the altar for the laity, and then the higher altar way up here, and then the choir where the monks would come, where the canons would come to sing. Simply a very private area for them alone. East of the choir was the altar, usually backed by a rear dose or an altar screen elaborately carved from wood or stone. You see it here. This one all carved from stone. This one from wood and gilt. Notice this, of course, is the altar. So this is about the size of a typical man. You can see how tall up it goes all the way to the ceiling. Behind the rear dose and around the choir in the transepts, were chapels dedicated to various saints. You see them here. Some private and maintained by local guilds, while others might have relics of the saints. Tombs of the rich and powerful might also be found here. This is Krakow Cathedral, Krakow Cathedral in Poland. So of course, the ceiling as heavily uh, painted as everywhere else. This is in uh, Windsor Chapel. Here, many of the kings and queens of England were buried. The apse itself, the apse being, remember, the far east end of the church, was either semicircular, as you see here, or a flat wall, as in uh, Durham Cathedral. 
often with his own altar dedicated to the Blessed Mother or a local saint. So yes, there are many altars in these cathedrals or churches. Next would come the cloister, a covered walkway, as you see here, surrounding a garden. Sometimes, by the way, the garden is where the monks themselves would later be buried. Now, it's a requisite part of daily life for monks to walk and contemplate. So the cloister, being covered, gave them shelter from sun or rain. And the cloister especially was usually built on the south side of the church to take full advantage of the sun during the day. Now, in a Benedictine monastery, monks would sleep communally in a dorter or dormitory. Let me see it here. This is typically what, how the monks would sleep. They do not sleep on raised beds. These are more just sort of mattresses stuffed with straw, and they are on the ground. It's almost like a futon. And these are the dorters, the, dom uh, the uh, dormitories at Eberbach Abbey, Alcobara Abbey, and uh, let's see, it. this one is, oh, Santa Curia Monastery. And this, of course, being the common room. The common room was always below the dormitory in a Benedictine Abbey. So this is simply where you'd go and sleep at night. The rest of the time, you could hang out and see your friends and tell crazy jokes, not that they would, in the common room. So, as I said, below the daughter was the common room, which was connected directly to the choir in the church by what's called the night stair, usually found on the east side of the cloister, so the monks could easily pass into the church in the dark for matin service, which was at 2 a.m. You see here, this is the night stair, worn by hundreds of years, of monks and uh, uh, canons coming down. So, of course, as I said, is the common room. And here is the night stair at Tintern Abbey. The infirmary was the community's hospital, primarily for the use of the monks, located away from the rest of the buildings to allow the sick to recuperate free of noise and distraction. It was also one of the few places where meat was served regularly to keep up the strength of the sick. And in many places, I mean, you look at these beds, the infirmary at Bone Abbey. Uh, everywhere else, you pretty much sleep on the floor, but here you get a real bed. Your own private bed. Which is why many of the monks often try to wind up in the infirmary as many times as they could during the day and during the week. Kind of like sailors, for example, trying to wind up in sick bay. It's a great way you get quiet, you don't have to do any work, and you get better food than elsewhere. The sacristy, where church vestments, hymnals, and service books were stored, was attached to the church at the end of the south transept. That's the cross as was normally the library and scriptorium. Again, especially the library and scriptorium, trying to get as much sunlight as possible to do the work. So the monks at the scriptorium is where the monks would copy text, copy out books. You see them doing here. It was not unusual, in fact, it was quite common for the scriptorium to essentially be outside in the cloister. Even in times of winter, they would be forced to go outside to copy the books. Of course, when it rained or snowed, they finally got to go inside. The chapter house was a large room with seats built in the walls. As you see here, this is Crowland Abbey, the chapter house, a recreation where the monks would all sit. This is Westminster Abbey, the chapter house, which, by the way, was the first meeting place for the House of Commons. Anywhere, the chapter house, 
the monks gathered daily, usually around 8 or 9 in the morning, to be read the entire Benedictine rule, which if you've ever read the Benedictine rule on your own, is quite lengthy. Always makes you wonder, after a while, did they simply start nodding off like, oh God, this again? Or did they really pay attention? Of course, it's all read to them in Latin. The abbot would assign to them the day's task, and if there was a dispute between the monks or a problem, it would be discussed before the abbot and decided there. The chapter house was usually attached to the east wing of the cloister. The south range generally housed the lavatorium. No, this is not the bathroom. The lavatorium, this is one here, it's really a kind of a fountain where the monks would wash before meals. And then there was the refectory, the dining room, where they ate, usually connected by an underground passage to the bakehouse and the brew house. You see, this is essentially how they all would have looked. You'd have the tables here. The monks would usually only be sitting on the outside, not the inside uh, of the tables, because in between is where the servers would come to serve the food. And everyone would have had a little sort of pulpit. In Denny Abbey, for example, here is a nun. But they also had them here, a pulpit here, or maybe one here. And there's one, hard to tell, there's one right here. Uh, we'll get to why that is. Next to the refectory was the kitchen, the pantry and buttery, and the cellar. Connected to that underground passageway with the warming room on the other side of the oven wall. In other words, when it was really cold out, you would simply get on the opposite side of where the ovens were. So here's the ovens, and then the opposite side of it would have been a room like this, the warming room. Of course, many a monk would claim to be cold in winter weather and try to spend as much time there during the day as possible. Not that all monks were lazy, but there were numerous complaints about that. Connected to the dorter and over a stream or ditch, kind of like this, kind of like this, a stream or ditch with flowing water was the rira dorter. This is the toilets. You see here, there's no individual stalls like this poor monk up here. You just sat down on one of these benches and did your duty. The idea was it just simply falls down into the flowing stream. The oblates or tertiaries, the Benedictines call them oblates, everyone else called them tertiaries, and the conversi would have their daughter and a refectory attached to the west range of the cloister. And if you really want to look closely, this is the numbered and descriptive view of Lewis Priory. The wrap-up quote. If it can be done, the monastery should be so situated that all the necessaries, such as water, the mill, the garden, are enclosed. And the various arts may be plied inside of the monastery, so that there may be no need for the monks to go about outside because it is not good for their souls. St. Benedict in the Benedictine Rule, circa 580 A.D. So, let me know what you think of this quote in the comments section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, and subscribe as it will help me bring you more great videos. And click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past. <laughs>